Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. I enjoyed my years as a member of the faculty and have enjoyed friendships with many of the faculty since then. So it is a special delight to be invited back. In this paper, I want to reflect on two questions that I think are integrally related. The first is, do Genesis 1 and 2 tell us anything about what God did in creating the world? Or are they only concerned with telling us why the world exists? That is, is the theology of creation rooted in the history of creation? The second is, if this material does tell us something of what God did in creating, how seriously does it address the question of creation out of nothing? I take it that if we answer the first question by saying that these chapters do not address the question of what he did, then the second is somewhat moot. If the only goal of the accounts is to establish a theology of creation unrelated to what God actually did, then what they may say about how he brought the world into existence is a matter of no consequence. On the other hand, if these chapters do intend to tell us something of how God made the world, the question of creatio ex nihilo takes on some importance. To begin to address the first question, I take it that all of us here agree that the Bible is the revealed word of God in which the one transcendent, personal, triune spirit has revealed to us his nature, his purposes for human life, his diagnosis of the human problem, and his solution to the problem in Jesus Christ. But where we might disagree is the basis upon which those truths are presented to us. In particular, how integral to theology is the space-time setting in which the theology emerges? Can they be separated? Given that the Bible, uniquely among holy books, roots its theological discourse in unique events and persons in time and space, that is, in human historical experience, how much of that setting must we give credence to? And furthermore, what is the function of setting the revelation in time and space? Is it merely stage setting, as it were? Or is that material inseparable from the theological assertions that we may extrapolate from it? For example, does it matter whether there was an Abraham or not? That is, can a true theology of grace and election be extracted from a legend? Of course, we've all heard the cliche, fiction often conveys truth better than facts. Apart from the fact that that's a false dichotomy, the much more important question is, does the Bible present itself in that way as using what are obviously legends and sagas to convey great truth? It does not. On the other hand, we have many examples from the ancient Near East of that sort of thing perhaps chief of which is the Gilgamesh epic. There we find legend pressed into service to express some rather profound reflections on the nature of life. But the differences between Gilgamesh epic and Abraham narrative are striking, even stunning. In the epic, the central character is lifted out of ordinary life precisely so that he may function as a representative figure. He is every man, a vehicle through whom certain truths gleaned from life experience can be expressed. Thus, we go from truth to Gilgamesh. Abraham, on the other hand, is no representative figure. He is presented, whether we accept the fact or not, as one unique individual through whose real life experience certain truths about reality are revealed. So why the difference? In the case of Gilgamesh, speculation about reality is expressed in a historical story. The Abraham narrative, on the other hand, recounts an encounter between God and an actual person in the context of which 
we encounter Abraham and learn something of the nature of reality, namely that God is not an arbitrary superhuman, a God, but rather, unlike the gods, is profoundly trustworthy. That is, here, why theology emerges from the what, divine activity, including speech in time and space, rather than the what existing as a vehicle for an intuited why. Now, perhaps you're saying, what does all that have to do with creation? Only this. I'm concerned that many of us who willingly grant that biblical theology emerges from the encounters with the divine in human historical experience after Genesis 12 seem all too ready to deny that necessity when it comes to all or parts of Genesis 1 to 11. In other words, it is suggested the modus operandi of Genesis 1 to 11 is different from the rest of scripture. I think this is very dangerous in that we are in this opening segment of the Bible replacing the very genius of the Bible with the manner of thought that the Bible is at pains to deny elsewhere. From that point of view, this segment takes certain ideas, perhaps intuitively derived from elsewhere in the Bible or in life, and uses traditional forms from the ancient world as vehicles for those ideas. That is, what is made a vehicle for why, exactly as pagan literature does. My response is, on the basis of the rest of the Bible, if we have no reliable indication of what God did in creating, then the why loses its warrant for our acceptance of it. It is speculation, perhaps inspired speculation, but speculation nonetheless, and not revelation. Could God have done that? I suppose so, but I don't know why he would. Furthermore, as I'll try to demonstrate below, there is good reason to believe that he did not. Before we leave this topic, we must inquire whether the biblical account, as is being increasingly asserted, is shaped by some, in some degree by ancient Near Eastern myths of origin. I do not call them creation myths because they're not about creation, a term which, because of its biblical associations, implies an absolute beginning. It is simply not the case that the biblical account rests upon such a base. There is far too much of a tendency among modern evangelicals to make much of the many superficial similarities between the Bible and the literatures of the cultures surrounding Israel and not to pay enough attention to the essential differences between them. Yes, there are similarities, but it is the radical differences in worldview, not to mention genre, between that which is found in the Bible and in the rest of ancient literature that should grasp our attention. One cannot read the Enuma Elish in its entirety, or even the 85 lines on the building of a temple for Marduk and believe that Genesis 1 and 2 are really the same kind of literature or are even thinking of the world in the same ways. I've laid this much emphasis upon this point because I believe it is so critical to what we're about. If the biblical accounts represent simply an odd mutation of ancient Near Eastern religion and literature, however precious that mutation may be to us personally, then it does not matter. <clears throat> whether we agree or disagree over what we think it happens to say about the origins of the cosmos and of life on this obscure little planet. It has lost its claim to be authoritative revelation. But if we grant the possibility that it is authoritative revelation, then the what and the why of creation are inseparably related. Then we may ask a further tripartite question. One, did the cosmos have an absolute beginning? Two, did God, the transcendent personal triune spirit, exist prior to the origins of the cosmos? And three, did he bring the universe into existence from nothing? If we say yes to these questions, then I would ask, on what basis do we make such assertions? 
I hear contradictory answers. Many reply with something like the following. Well, the Bible teaches those things, though, of course, not in Genesis. Then I ask, where is creatio ex nihilo taught in the Bible? Is it Nehemiah 9, 6? You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that's in them. You give life to everything. Or is it Psalm 90, verse 2? Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God? Or is it the poem about wisdom in Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, which reads in part, the Lord brought me forth at the first of his works before the deeds of old. I was formed long ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. But all of those are more elusive than actual assertions. The first bald assertion, I may say bald assertion, is only found in 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees, chapter 7, verse 28, where we read a mother speaking to a son who is thinking about joining Antiochus. I beg you, my child, look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed in the same way the human race came into being. Canonically, in the New Testament, we find Romans 4.17, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Or Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what was invisible. But even these are questioned. And as a result, Gerhard May, a German theologian writing in 1994, argued very forcefully that the Bible's witness to creation from nothing is entirely ambiguous and that the doctrine was really developed in the late second century to combat the Hellenistic idea of the eternity of matter. Paul Copan and William Lane Craig have refuted this argument in their book, Creation Out of Nothing, and I recommend it very warmly. I don't intend to repeat all the data they present there. However, I do want to underline some of the main arguments and then explicitly argue that unless creatio ex nihilo is not merely implicit in Genesis 1, but is an assumed understanding, a conclusion, if you will, upon which the rest of the biblical writers argue. If that's not the case, then May's argument makes some sense. If, in fact, Genesis 1 was understood by later biblical writers to teach the truth that God created the earth from nothing, then their elusive references to the idea make sense. But if, as some of us now maintain, Genesis really has no interest in the question, then the first and only reasonably clear statement does not appear in the canon until at the very end of the New Testament period in the book of Hebrews, depending on what you think of making things out of what was invisible. That's hardly a basis for a robust doctrine of creation. On the other hand, if we understand that creatio ex nihilo is not merely implied by the language of Genesis, but is the logical conclusion of what is said there, then we have a foundation upon which the rest of biblical teaching can stand. Furthermore, we have a solid base from which to understand the meaning of creation for Christian faith. All that being said, let me return to the question. How does Genesis, and by extension, the rest of the Bible, speak to the common notion, not only in the ancient world, but in the modern one as well, that matter, in some form or another, has always existed? This is the importance of this question. Around the world, apart from the Bible, it is the assumption matter has always existed, and that is as much true today for modern science as it was for Gudea in Sumer. 
That's the importance of the question. As I've pointed out above, some say the text of Genesis doesn't pronounce on the subject. I say again that if the text does not pronounce on the subject, then the whole doctrine of creation is called into question. Because finally, this is a very strong statement, the entire biblical worldview rests on this point. You see, there really are only two worldviews, the biblical one and the other one. The other one says that the cosmos, this psycho-socio-physical cosmos, is the sum total of reality. There are variations on this theme, but the central point remains the same. It may take a modern slant with some suggestion that matter being the indestructible base all sorts of energy, including spiritual energy, are derived from it. Or it may take a more ancient form in which the material elements are infused with spirit. The biblical view is unique. It has never been consistently maintained in any other source. That view is that the psycho-socio-physical cosmos is not all there is. There is a triune personal spirit who, while utterly transcending the cosmos, can and does penetrate the cosmos at will. The cosmos only exists because he wills it to. The conflict between those two views did not come to the fore only in the second century AD Hellenistic period. It reaches as far back as history can go. Here is what, if we say that Genesis 1 the account of the origin of the cosmos has no interest in the question of the eternal existence of matter, we have really made that chapter of no relevance to a biblical theology of creation. But Genesis 1 does address this question. First of all, it asserts that God exists prior to matter. But does it? Recently, at least to some extent, driven by the conclusion that Genesis has the same worldview as its neighbors, the proposal, made first by Ibn Rashi in the 11th century, has gained currency that verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1 should be translated as, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void. That is, according to that reading, the text says nothing one way or the other to the point of God's preexistence. Many of you will be aware of the issues involved in this reading, but for those who are not familiar with them, let me recap them briefly. The traditional reading, as found in the King James tradition, takes the opening words as an independent clause, functioning as an opening colophon. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Here, there can be no question but that God pre-existed the cosmos as expressed in the merism, heaven and earth. This reading has the full support of the ancient versions. However, the word translated beginning, reshit, appears to be in the form of a construct noun, beginning of. And when it appears with nouns such as rule, it results in a temporal clause translated as in the beginning of the rule of X or when X began to rule. However, if the term is taken as a construct, Genesis 1.1 is the only place in the Bible where it is in construct with a verb. Every place else, Rashid is in construct with a noun. More likely, it should be understood as the versions have understood it, not as a construct, but as a substantive, as it is in Isaiah 46.10. I make the end, acharit, known from the beginning. Rashid. Possibly, it might have been thought originally to have an understood though unexpressed genitive complement as in the beginning of time or the beginning of things, but then came to be understood as it is in Genesis simply as an independent noun, the beginning. In any case, there is no good reason to vary from the traditional reading, which makes the preexistence of God very explicit. But perhaps the biblical writers conceived of some sort of dualism whereby both spirit and matter preexisted the present cosmos. 
This idea gained currency with the rise of the conclusion that all the ancient origin myths began with some sort of primeval matter in chaotic form. This original matter was typically seen as being watery in nature. The gods emerged from this eternal watery chaos, often by sexual means, but then chaos sought to get rid of his or her unruly offspring. I always liked that as having once been the father of teenagers. <laughs> Tiamat wanted to get rid of humans because they were too noisy. Yeah, shut that thing off. In the upshot, the gods defeated chaos and reordered matter into its present form. This idea was popularized and applied to the Bible by Hermann Gunkel, writing in 1895. In this light, the reference to without form and void, tohu wabohu, seemed to be a clear reflection of that theme. When that's coupled with the decision to take the opening clause of Genesis 1-1 as a dependent temporal clause, when God began to create the earth, everything was void. It seemed to make perfect sense. Genesis 1 was a sterilized form of an original Hebrew creation myth in which the gods, Elohim, defeated chaos. In this form, when God began to create the chaos, he had to reorder chaotic pre-existing matter. The ambiguity regarding whether he himself perhaps emerged from matter was the result of the sterilization process. However, the consensus concerning creation and chaos has begun to be called into question. Students of ancient cultures from Ugarit to Rome have begun to reevaluate their sources and to question whether the struggle with forces of disorder was as determinative for originating order as they had supposed. But beyond that, it is now seriously questioned whether chaos and the so-called chaos monster have any relevance for Old Testament studies at all. Rebecca Watson has exhaustively reviewed all the supposed references to chaos in the Bible, especially those in the Psalms, and has reached the conclusion that, I quote, the term chaos should be abandoned in respect to the Old Testament, close quote. As regards Genesis 1, while she counts this as one of the late texts, exilic or later, she does not see tohu wabohu as having anything to do with pre-existing chaotic matter. Rather, she follows the lead of David Samura, who has convincingly argued that tohu refers to what is empty and uninhabited, not to something chaotic. In summary, then, we can say that it's incorrect to believe that Genesis 1, 1, and 2 envisions some pre-existent and perhaps resistant matter expressed by tohu wabohu, out of which God proceeded to fashion the cosmos. Rather, what it tells us is that God's first creative act was to form the game board, as it were, upon which he would then place the creatures that he spoke into existence. Thus, our text leaves no room for any idea of pre-existent matter. It tells us that only one element existed before everything else, God, who in his divine will would speak the worlds into existence. We've now discussed what I think of as two links in the chain, which establishes that the understanding that God made the universe from nothing is the appropriate conclusion to Genesis 1, 1 to 3. The first link is the assertion that in the beginning, before God, anything else existed, God acted. There is the preexistence of God. The second link is that matter did not coexist with God, but was made by him. The third link has to do with what it was that God did. And this is the term bara. When the Hebrew text says that God performed the action that the verb bara connotes, what was he doing? First of all, it is of no small consequence that cognates only appear in late Syro-Aramaic and in Old South Arabic with the sense of building. There is no cognate in Akkadian or Ugaritic. There is no equivalent concept in Sumerian or Egyptian. Yet the concept occurs some 50 times in the Hebrew Bible. This fact strongly suggests that the concept it expresses is one that is unknown elsewhere. 
That's exactly what we would expect, given the fact that none of the surrounding cultures know anything of a God who pre-existed matter, bringing matter into existence, both non-physically and non-mechanically. A second important point is that the only subject used for this verb is God. Thus, it has a profoundly theological significance. This is something unique that only God does. Helmer Ringgren expresses it this way, quote, Bara is used to express the incomparability of the creative work of God in contrast to all secondary products and likenesses made from already existing material by man, close quote. W.H. Smith makes the following trenchant observations. One, there is no evidence whatsoever that bara one, create, kal and nifal, is derived from the same root as bara three, pl, to cut. Two, citing Wellhausen, the term stands for nothing else than the creative agency of God as opposed to all human shaping and making. Three, no material from which God performs this activity is ever mentioned. Four, the objects vary, but they are always special, extraordinary, new. And five, God's activity, quote, brings about something new, which as such did not exist before, close quote. While both Ringgren and Schmidt mention in asides that the word does not explicitly express creation out of nothing, both their discussions make it clear that such an understanding is not ruled out. This is exclusively divine activity involving no expressed material, contrasting with the way in which humans make things, as a result of which something that has not existed before emerges. Let me say that again. This is exclusively divine activity involving no expressed material, contrasting with the way in which humans make things as a result of which something that has not existed before emerges. Even in the case where something did exist before, as for instance, the heart in Psalm 51.10, where David asks that God would create a new heart in me, it appears that the writer is not asking for a renovation of his previous self-construct, but for a completely new one, one that is not defiled by self-serving sin. So also in the case of Israel, when God is said to have created a people for himself, Isaiah 43, 1, he brought into existence something that had not existed in any form previously, a people belonging exclusively to Yahweh. So, in the light of this discussion, what does bara mean in Genesis 1.1? Clearly, it means that God made the universe out of nothing. There was nothing out of which to make it. So Forrester can say in Genesis 1, here creation is an action. It arises out of nothing but the word of God. Unquestionably, the Apostle John agrees with this understanding as he begins his gospel with the classic words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. However, there have been two alternate understandings proposed in recent years that contest this widely held understanding of the word. In a longer version of this lecture, I deal with each of them at some length. Here, I'll only summarize the arguments. The first is that of Ellen Van Wolda, who has proposed that the meaning of the word is to separate. The major argument against such an idea is that while bara is regularly paralleled with words having to do with make, shape, and form, it is never paralleled with words having to do with separation. Beyond that, it does not even fall within the domain of separation. A second recent proposal for the understanding of bara comes from John Walton. He proposes that the word should mean something like create by assigning functions. In the first place, this is a meaningless collocation in modern English. 
The dictionary definition of create is to bring something into existence or to cause something to happen. To assign a function is not to create in English. Walden argues that the only reason we interpret create as creating matter is because of our modern interest in the material origins of things. He says the ancient world had no real interest in the material origins of the universe and that therefore the word cannot have had anything to do with bringing something into existence. I wonder how he can make that assertion from this distance in time. The ancient Greek philosophers, like Thales and Heraclitus, were certainly concerned with the material basis of the universe. Furthermore, the objects of bara in Genesis 1 are certainly material, including heaven and earth, the sea monsters, 121, and human beings, 127. Even if one takes this meaning for bara, which Professor Walton has created, namely that the word means to assign a function, all these objects are material. One can only say that God was not bringing these material objects into existence if one has predetermined that the verb cannot mean to do, to make, to shape. Thus far, this study has argued that the concept of creation out of nothing is understood by the writer of Genesis 1. It is not explicitly stated, but it is understood and is the necessary conclusion of what is said. The language chosen makes the point very clear. I have identified three links in the chain of argument and mentioned a fourth. They are, in the beginning, God. God existed before matter. The earth was a wasteland. Matter did not coexist with God. Created. God brought something new into existence that had not existed previously. For God spoke. Matter did not emerge from the body of God. I believe that the idea that God brought the cosmos into being from nothing is in the light of these the only natural conclusion, one that the rest of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, takes for granted and thus does not feel a need to mount an argument for. In the final section of the paper, I want to look at what might be called a case study in support of the assertions made in the previous paragraph. The single largest collection of reflections on creation to be found in the Bible is in the book of Isaiah, between chapters 40 and 65, and especially between 40 and 48. Here the verb bara occurs 20 times, 14 in 40 to 48, three times as frequently as it occurs in Genesis. I believe that the prophet uses the term with the understanding that the cosmos was created out of nothing. He is utilizing the term because of the centrality of the concept of creation, including creation from nothing, in his case against the Babylonian idol gods. His point is to say that since the gods did not create the world and thus can give no account of such creation, the former things, therefore they can give no account of the direction and purpose of the creation, the things to come. Furthermore, since they are simply cosmic forces wearing human-like masks, all the work of humans, they cannot foretell the future in any specific way. But Yahweh, being the transcendent creator, who is not part of the cosmos, who brought the cosmos into being, can see the cosmos and all that occurs in it from beginning to end and can make, indeed has made, just such predictions. Finally, <clears throat> Excuse me. Being the creator, unfettered in any way except by his righteous love, he can deliver his people from exile, something unheard of and deemed impossible, and in the end, create a new heaven and new earth. In all of this, 
the continuing emphasis upon Yahweh's ability to do new things, things that had never occurred before. Here is where the assumption of creation out of nothing comes into play. These things that Yahweh was going to do had no prior existence. They were de novo. The gods, part of the never-ending cycle of existence, could only do differing versions of what they'd always done and always would do. That cosmos has no beginning and no end. In it, one can never be truly delivered from the past. Salvation can never be transformation, but only self-realization. In a longer form of this paper, I have surveyed all of the 20 occurrences. However, for the purposes of this lecture and your ability to sit, I have chosen a selection, which I believe make the point adequately. Isaiah 40, 26, as mentioned above, has Yahweh creating the heavenly host. That is, he brought them into being, made them, unlike Marduk in the Enoma Elish, who only assigned functions for them. In 4028, he is also the creator of the ends of the earth. Thus, in these two verses, Isaiah is clearly beginning his treatment in the same place Genesis does. Yahweh is the sole creator of the cosmos, which exists only because he wills it to exist. Then in 41, 18 to 20, Yahweh promises to do a series of unheard of things, such as making rivers flow on barren heights, all to show that he has done this, he has created it. Here again, the emphasis is upon Yahweh's ability to do things never heard of before, things that are without precedent, entirely new. In 42, 5 and 6, it is the creator of the heavens and the earth who gives breath, nishmach, see Genesis 2, 7, to its people, and then miraculously calls and sustains the servant who will restore the creator's intended order, mishpat, to the cosmos. Here in two verses, we have creation, recreation, capsulized. The one who did something completely new in creating the earth is able to do the impossible, become human, in order to recreate it. In 43.1, the connection between creation and salvation is made explicit. Yahweh created and formed Jacob Israel, and he has redeemed them. It is significant that it is not merely said, as elsewhere, that God called them or chose them. No. He created them, formed them. That is, he brought them into existence. As Peter says, those who were no people, he has made a people, 1 Peter 2.10. So the one who has made them has redeemed them. 54.5, your maker is your redeemer. If anything, that thought is made even more forcefully in 43.7. And I did not read produce that one. In 43.7, where we read, every one of Israel who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. It seems to me that the expansion of created by means of formed and made leaves no room for any connotation of assigning a function without reference to the origin of the things so defined. Equally, there's no room for any connotation of separation among things already existing. This is to make something brand new. The same paralleling of form and make is found in what is almost the parade statement of the unique nature of creation in the Bible. It is a verse that is troubling to some readers, but it should not be so. The statement is found in 45, 6c to 7, which says in the context of divine assertions of absolute uniqueness, I am Yahweh, and there is no other who forms light and creates darkness, who makes good and creates evil. That's my translation. It's particularly, of course, the last clause that troubles people with its suggestion that God causes moral evil. That's not the case, but that is not the point I want to emphasize here. The point that Yahweh is making with this statement 
is that everything in the cosmos exists solely because of him. Everything in the cosmos exists solely because of him. There is no first, other first cause anywhere. Nothing exists apart from him. In this context, of course, anything other than creation out of nothing is impossible to imagine. Along with 45.7, 4518 is another parade example of the point being made in this paper. Here we're told God did not create the earth to be an uninhabited wasteland. If in fact it is the tendency of the world as we know it to return to such a state as the second law of thermodynamics would have it, that's not what the creator intended. Nor is the world meaningless and purposelessness. He did not speak secrets in a land of darkness. This is the diametric opposite of the dark, meaningless, shapeless, watery matter that ancient people from Sumer to Rome thought was the eternal state of things from which human security had to be continually wrested. No, as Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. There was purposive creation from the outset with no resistant opposing force to be overcome. Thus, 46.10 can say, I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come, I say, my purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. I'd suggest that Reshit is being used here as a conscious allusion to Genesis 1.1. The final occurrences of bara in the book of Isaiah are of great significance. In the chiastic structure of chapters 56 to 66, with 61, 1 to 3 being the apex of the chiasm, chapters 63, 7 to 65, 16 are reiterating the sinfulness of an Israel that arrogantly assumes that its elect position guarantees it a place of approval from God. That's paralleling the first treatment of that subject, which is found in 56.9 to 59.15a. Chapter 65 uses harsh language to describe this condition, ultimately contrasting you, the arrogant self-righteous, with my servants, who are contrite and faithful. That's in verses 8 through 16. This subunit closes with the statement concerning the servants. For the past troubles will be forgotten and hidden from my eyes. That leads into the description of final redemption, 65, 17 to 25. This is the kingdom of the Messiah. 65, 25's clear allusions to 11, 6 to 8, concluding with the quotation of 11, 9a, there will, no one will be, do harm in all of my kingdom. That conclusion makes it plain, the illusion. With the poem ending on that note, it is very significant that the opening verse of the poem contains a clear allusion to Genesis 1.1. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. It seems to me unmistakable that the prophet is drawing on the idea of creation out of nothing as, it looks, as he looks at what is to come. Just as the original creation had no pre-existing basis, neither will this new one. Thus he says that the former things, the original creation and the tragedy that enveloped it will not even be remembered. Instead, Yahweh will create something completely new. The repetition of create in verse 18 is not accidental. The redeemed will rejoice forever in this new creation, for he will create a new Jerusalem that will be a delight and not a reproach. I say again that the prophet is assuming the doctrine of creation out of nothing, as his inspired imagination sees the new creation. Will there be continuities? Of course, it's a new Jerusalem. But it will not be the old Jerusalem renovated. It will be a new start. 
This is what is in the mind of John when he speaks of a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. Revelation 21, 1. The allusions to Isaiah 65, 17 to 25 are all through Revelation 21, 1 to 5. And those allusions reach their climax with the royal pronouncement in verse 5, I am making everything new. For Isaiah, creation involves that divine activity whereby something without precedent comes into being, something that is not dependent upon or conditioned by any preceding element. The prophet uses the word in this way because this is his understanding of the word and the concept based upon his understanding of the initial assertions in Genesis 1 and following. As we bring this discussion to a close, the words of Alan J. Torrance are most appropriate. Finally, the collective effect of all the above, what he had said previously in the article, should be to affirm in the most radical way that Christian faith knows no doctrine of creation that is not a doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oswald. You won't get off so easily, so we will keep you up here. Uh, and uh, there will be, I'm sure, a number of uh, questions asked. I would ask, we've got some microphones uh, to your left and right. Uh, and so if you have a question that you would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Oswald, please make your way to the microphone, and uh, he will be glad to uh, respond to that. Uh, as you are thinking about these things, let me ask a question. Um, a couple of things, actually. Uh, one is, You've been at this now for uh, a number of years, teaching uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, scholars, pastors, etc. cetera. Um, it seems like this would not have been a lecture you would have had to have given uh, 20 years ago. Probably, M maybe you would have. Give us just a sort of a brief historical cultural background such that why, how have we come to this place such that these things, uh, evangelical scholars, there's disagreement? Uh, what, is, you know, what are some of the pressing pressure points that makes this lecture so critical today? Well, when you've lived 100 years like I have. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> you see, especially in biblical studies, I, I'm, I can't speak for other disciplines, but in biblical studies, you see an amazing pendulum swing. When I began my seminary work, neo-orthodoxy, or the biblical theology movement, whatever you want to call it, had gained a lot of traction. So the pendulum that had swung over here with Valhausen had swung considerably back. You could read Eichrott, you could read Van Rott, and you could find exciting stuff there. Yeah, they would buy into J, E, D, and P, but they e basically eviscerated it in the process. Now, 60 years later, the pendulum has swung back. Uh, Wellhausen has been resuscitated in uh, some interesting ways. And more than that, it's the, the insistence the Bible must be one more piece of ancient Near Eastern literature. It is nothing more. You cannot explain its differences on the basis of revelation. That argument is ruled out of court immediately. You cannot use it in the debate. So, since we can't explain the differences by revelation, therefore, there are no differences. One God, okay, but hey, it's a God. They believe in lots of gods, these people believe in one God. That's not a difference. And so it goes. So that the real thrust in biblical studies today is to deny the power of the differences mm -hmm. to say this is a different kind of literature. Yeah. No, it isn't. These are just superficial. The illustration that I have used for many years is obviously 
my dog and I are the same thing. The dog has hair, but <laughs> the dog has four appendages. The dog has one set of nostrils. The dog has two eyes. More to the point, it has a circulatory system that's just like mine. It has a gastroenterological system that's just like mine. It has a circulatory system just like mine. So obviously, any difference between me and the dog is superficial. I want to say, as much as I love my dog, I think the differences are essential. But that's where the discussion is. We have to collapse any possible differences because it cannot be distinctive literature. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Ryan, please, and then Dick. Dr. Oswald, thank you so much uh, for this great lecture. I have a question about uh, you're um, taking us to Isaiah 65 there at the end, and you're making the connection of the, the bara, that common theme. What do you see as the implications of that for thinking about our eschatology, uh, specifically the continuity between this earth and the new earth, the new heavens, new earth to come? It would seem like uh, an implication of your view of that text could be, well, because bara always involves this creation out of nothing component, we've got to say that for the new creation as well, and therefore we really would minimize, if not deny, any continuity with this current earth because it would be used in the forming of the new. Does that question oh, yeah, make sense? Yeah, I'd love no, to hear that's, you address that's a, that, please. That's a very appropriate question. Um, I'm a premillennialist. I think that the millennial teaching suggests that there will be a period when this earth will be what it was meant to be, but at the end of that period, a new heaven and a new earth come to be. Now, will there be, it's, it's one God, he's the same God. <laughs> so I have to say, I think that in terms of philosophical principles, all those other things, obviously there's going to be a continuity. But it won't be this world redone, I think. I think when he consciously says, I create new heaven and new earth, I just think he's jumping back to Genesis 1 and saying, here's a new era. Now, let, let me uh, clarify something. Bara. The word bara does not mean create out of nothing. Bara means to create something brand new without precedent. For me, the strongest statement of that is number 1620, when Moses says, if God creates something new, or not, he doesn't say, if God creates and the earth opens up and swallows these guys, you'll know whose side God is on. Well, that's something new. That's something that had never happened before. He's obviously using material there. He's using the earth. But he's doing something without precedent. Now, I'm then arguing that when you couple that with God existed before matter and God did not exist with matter, <laughs> to do something brand new in those circumstances has to be out of nothing. Thanks. Dick? Okay, well, uh, John, you and I are friends. And are we? we? Have, <laughs> and we have some disagreements, and one of them is the whole issue of Genesis 1 1. But um, uh, uh, there are a couple things that um, I struggled with right from the start, and that is. Gilgamesh is the king of Ur Uruk. He's a particular person. He's not every man. Okay. And, then, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and it's in time because he then goes to the guy who survived the flood. You know what I mean? And so on and so forth. So that's, an off, that's very, very difficult for me to conceive of reading Gilgamesh as every man. The second thing is... And in I the search read, for immortality? Well, uh, yeah, but it's, it's a single man that's searching for immortality. It's not, he's not searching for immortality for all people. I, like I would disagree with you there. Yeah. I mean, he represents some of the things yeah. that every, is in every man, but he's a particular man. Okay? But he's not doing what any of us particular people do. 
Right. This is he's not different. ordinary he's life. He's a king. Right, that's right. So no, he's but I mean, he's going different. to see Utnapishtim, none of, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So therefore, he's not every man. That's legendary, though, is what I'm saying. Yeah. He's a representative it, figure. Yeah, I don't know of anybody that's read Gilgamesh as every man. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about that. The second thing is that in uh, Genesis uh, 1, you mentioned bara, but I think you've corrected yourself here because you mentioned in a series that it includes creation without any other previ previous existing matter. But that can't be right, okay? Because in Genesis 127, he created man and woman bara, but then in Genesis 2, he created the man out of the dust and so on and so forth. So you're creating contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2. If you hold that. So I think your correction on that is, is very important. Okay. But um, uh, I have to go to a PhD meeting. I would love to listen to all the discussion and so on. But uh, uh, yes, we are friends. As far <laughs> as, as, we far are. as we I are. am concerned. We are. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, so, yes, we are. So, uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. Bara does not in itself mean creation out of nothing. It means create something without precedent. So thank you for eating and running, Dick. <laughs> we understand. Thank and we'll you. wait to say bad things about you till you're gone. <laughs> thank you. Good. No, good we will not say dialogue. bad things. Yes. Thank you. Thank as, you. As colleagues, yes, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a question about the building. Is that mic on? A question about the uh, the structure of the argument in the first section yes. of the paper. If I understood you correctly, you argued that if Genesis were only a revelation of the why and not the what, in other words, if it didn't speak to right. creation ex nihilo or not, then it wouldn't be a revelation. It would be only a, um, a kind of speculation of yes. sorts. Yes. But I'm not sure if I follow the okay. argument. For example, why couldn't it hypothet hypothetically be a revelation that God is the source of all finite being from all eternity or something? Not that I'm saying that is what it says, yeah. but no, why, no. why does it impinge no. on the question of whether it's revelation yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this is why I said, could God have done that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think he could have, I, 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 presumably. Mm -hmm. My problem is I see the rest of scripture rooted continuously in what God does in unique events and persons in time and space. And on the basis of that, he then says, this is who I am. I just... I cannot understand why he would not do that in Genesis 1 to 11. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Genesis 1 to 11. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that on the basis of what constitutes revelation mm -hmm. from Genesis 12 on, mm -hmm. why wouldn't that constitute revelation from Ge in Genesis 1 to 11? Sure, yeah. And, and that makes sense to me, but it's more if, if we grant that God could do it, then it seems yeah. like it would follow that he could reveal it yes. as well. Yes, but so, yeah. But yeah. OK, no, thanks. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, please uh, go to a mic microphone. First question, talking about ancient civilizations. Yes. Pre-biblical times, they did not have the world view of improvement. It was basically doing correct what you did before. The whole idea of creating something new was a whole new concept and caused the advancements where it was the idea of mankind to also create something new and to advance its societies. So with that, if a society, mankind, removes the biblical God you, you want to continue on from that <laughs> statement? I think you could. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, again, this is a very, very broad statement, but I'll, I'll stand by it. It's from the biblical worldview that we get history. It's from the biblical worldview that we get the value of the individual. It's from the biblical worldview that we get the idea of the possibility of progress. It's from the biblical worldview that we get the concept of that which is absolutely so, whether I like it or not. Now, that, put those together, and you find in the Bible the most liberating force in the world. 
Every place the Bible has gone, people have been set free. Mm -hmm. But the Bible is its own worst enemy. What happens? Historicism, mm -hmm. individualism, progressivism, and ultimately the denial of truth. So, yes, I, I agree with you fully. Why is truth disappearing as a concept as we breathe? Because the Bible is disappearing. Cut out the idea that there is a sole creator who is not this world, who is absolutely reliable, and truth dissolves like snow and sun. So, yes, the whole idea. And, and you know, it, it, it starts, excuse me, I get excited about these things. <laughs> it, it starts with Abraham. Abraham, I dare you to leave your whole support system behind and go to some place you don't know, and I'll tell you when you get there. And I'll give you the things you long for. Prophecy and fulfillment. There is progress. There is the possibility of creating that which is new. And that, of course, is the fascinating cry of the book of Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You rule out the transcendent creator and newness is gone. Thank you. You can be my straight woman anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, come up to the microphone, please. If others of you have questions, just make your way to one of the microphones, um, please. In Genesis 1, 2, uh, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. So how do you understand the role of the spirit you know, in play in creation? And it's a relationship with the creation out of nothing, mm -hmm. you know, the role mm -hmm. of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we've moved beyond the opening colophon now, and we're beginning to talk about how it is that God is making the game board, as it were. And how does God operate in this world? He operates through his spirit so that uh, the spirit is the way in which God works in this world through creation. So I, I, don't, I don't see that as, as raising any questions at all. It's, it's just, okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Got it? Okay, now then, how did he do this? Through his own spirit involvement in the world, he began to shape what he had brought into existence as a place for humans, ultimately, to live. Thank you. Jeffrey? Thank you, Dr. Oswald, for that lecture. Uh, I, like you, have reservations with uh, Dr. Walton's material functional distinction or dichotomy. Uh, it's also clear that he's trying to resist this sort of naive or simple concordism. Um, it's easy to conflate the Big Bang with ex nihilo. And so I think it'd be helpful if, for you to maybe help us understand what's different about ex nihilo from the Big Bang. Why is it not merely a statement about material origins? What else is at stake? Um, and would you want to see any kind of similarity between Ex Nihilo and Big Bang, or do you see them as distinct, as different, different claims? Well, first of all, they are different. Uh, Big Bang theory has no other purpose than to try to understand how this material cosmos exists. The place that was exciting for so many is that it does suggest an absolute beginning, which prior to that was poo-pooed on every hand. This is a universe that has always existed and will always exist in its present shape. No. <laughs> there was a point when it did not exist in this shape, and booey, here we are. So to that extent, there is a connection. But I would certainly want to uh, 
say as, as loudly and as forcibly as I can, the purpose of Genesis 1 and 2 is not, first of all, to tell us what God did. The purpose of Genesis 1 and 2 is to tell us who he is, who we are, why the world exists, and what he made us for. Its purpose is theological, whereas the whole Big Bang Theory, its purpose is strictly material. Now, the other thing that oftentimes, um, you know, I, I very much appreciate Hugh Ross and all that he's done, but one of the pushbacks that is brought to Ross is, well, who knows what there was before the Big Bang? Maybe a black hole existed forever. And one day it just got too heavy and blew up. So, no, I don't think the Big Bang Theory, though it is supportive of the idea of creatio ex nihilo, it certainly does not necessitate it. But in the idea of an absolute beginning, which I think is what Genesis teaches us, yes, to that extent, I think there is an overlap, and we can say, how interesting. Uh, but on the other hand, as has always been the case, I think we always have to look at scientific discovery with respect and with caution. Because what they say today may be very different from what they say tomorrow. And it is only the word <laughs> that is eternal. And uh, so we can say, thanks, <laughs> glad for this, but ultimately, and, and you know, here's, here's where John Walton and I would agree. I, I, I certainly, he would say, I think, to me, well, John, you are, you are saying that the purpose of Genesis is to tell us the material origins of the universe. And I want to say, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just wanting to say, I think, I think that the theological assertions are inseparable from the statements about what God did. Now, I have friends who will say, oh, then in that case, you are a 24-hour, seven-day creationist, aren't you? And I say, no. I don't think that what God did as described in Genesis limits us to that understanding of what he did. I think there are multiple possibilities there. But I simply want to say, I, for me, the why, the theology, is inseparable from the what. Mm -hmm. God did something, and as a result of that, I know what reality is. Does that get at it? Okay. Another question? Uh, as, <laughs> yeah, make your way to the microphone, please. Thank you. Is the bara, if I'm using the word correctly, the ultimate bara is the salvation of the individual, the making something new? I guess I would say, I guess I would say there is a continuity. Okay. From the original bara, God brought something into the world, into existence that did not exist previously. And the continuity is, he can make something new in me. And Psalm 51.10, create a new heart. Yeah, yeah. Transformation is possible. Our world does not believe that. No, the best you can hope for is self-realization. Just become more of what you are. And I think the Bible says, no, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Yeah. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Amen. Uh, let me, we've got a few minutes left. If you've got questions, let me ask this. Uh, the theme this year is affirming the doctrine of creation. You've started uh, wonderfully with the creatio ex nihilo. Um, that would be one of the essentials. So if we're going to affirm the doctrine of creation, that would be, what would be others? So, so what, what would you say are sort of, and I don't, 
it, it's tough, it's hard to be a maximalist, but yet there, there needs to be some minimalists as well. What are the minimal that must be affirmed, and what are some, Dr. Oswalt, that you would say th those matters we could agree to disagree on, but what would you perceive to be some of the essentials on a doctrine of creation? Well, I'm sorry that my friend Dick Averbeck isn't here to correct <laughs> me, but uh, <laughs> since he isn't. <laughs> Was God intentionally and purposefully involved at every stage of creation? Now, some of, of my friends in Biologos react real negatively if I say, it sounds to me like what you're proposing is deism. That, that God started the process intentionally and purposefully and then let it go. Uh, and they'll, they'll react, I think, rightly, pretty strongly against that. On the other hand, they will accuse me of saying, well, you're the God of the gaps guy. Uh, oh, yeah, well, we can't figure out how that happened, so God did that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really want to go there either. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me... As far as the Bible is concerned, as far as Genesis 1 is concerned, if it's saying anything, it is saying God was directly involved at every stage of the process. Mm -hmm. I don't think <clears throat> time is an essential. Mm -hmm. I, years ago, uh, when I, probably my first year of teaching, I, we were doing a team talk course, and, and my uh, fellow professor said something that I've never, ever forgotten. He said, we Christians, a scientist says something, and we say, no, the Bible says, and we kill him. 200 years later, we say, oh, I guess maybe the Bible doesn't say that, and we erect a monument to him. Yeah. I think we've got to be real, real careful that we don't insist well, the Bible says this, therefore. I think we've got to be so. As my scientist friends tell me, hey, this cosmos has been here a long, long time. I say, I think the Bible will accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Others will say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, basically, God preexisted chaos, but God <laughs> preexisted the universe, the cosmos, yeah. and God directed the entire process intentionally and purposefully. And third, humanity is the apex of the process. We are not trousered apes, as one book title had it some years ago. For me, those are, those are the three. Thank you. Uh, one more question, since no one else, and we've got till 1230. Uh, so you can eavesdrop on our discussion here. <laughs> um, part of it is this. Uh, you know, here in an academic setting, these things, uh, they're, they're, they're good discussions, necessary discussions. But then you think about uh, teaching Sunday school class on Sunday. Um, and uh, is it required that those sitting in the pew or sitting in a Sunday school class in our local churches need uh, another academic degree to understand this <laughs> stuff? So what counsel, friend, would you give to us that are, that are we're being taught these things, and rightly so, we need to. We need to be wrestling with these things. But then how do we, uh, without calling into question the, 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 the pietism or the, the, the simple faith that one might have uh, in the authority of the Bible, but also helping them to realize um, some of these other matters that are critical today so that they can think carefully and respond wisely uh, being faithful to the scriptures, what counsel might you give to us? Well, frankly, I think this is the crisis of the church today. I think uh, one of the crises of the church. I think we've got this vast gap between a pious faith and where the world is. And I think um, I think we've got to be much more intentional in uh, educating our people, uh, how, how we get them involved. In one sense, this is discipleship. 
But it means, I think, I think it means we have to train a cadre, five, six, seven men and women, who then are able to go train another group. Uh, I've, I've always admired uh, Bible Study Fellowship in what it does in terms of teaching the teachers on the day, and the next day the teachers go and teach the rest. I, I think we've got to be more intentional in this kind of thing and in then saying to people, here are the issues. Here's, here's, here's what's going on in seven-day creationism. Here's what's going on in intelligent design. Here's what's going on in um, uh, theological evolution. Here are the issues. Uh, and I think we can do that without having to do a graduate degree. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got to do the same thing with homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Here, here's what's going on. Here's, here's, now again, I don't know how many of you are pastors yet. <laughs> Some of you are going to be. But I, 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 really, I really think that one of the things that ought to be high on your list is how am I educating my people? Thank you for that. Let's uh, thank Dr. Oswald for lecturing. Thank you. And, and thank, thank you all as well for the good questions. You know, in light of the last thing that you just said, uh, uh, it's why I taught for a decade senior high school students for that very reason. Yeah. Uh, teaching them things so that when they would leave home or leave the church uh, and when they would be exposed to these things, it would not be the first time they heard it. Yeah, and oh, that they yeah. would then oh, they, yeah. they would then either it's an either or either yeah. you retain your Christian faith idiots believe what yeah, you believe that's right. or intelligent people believe yes, that right yeah and just to prepare them for that the other thing I would say regarding this topic is um, and I, I I say it only because it's it's on uh, the website we held a conference here on Trinity's campus last January and the pre-conference addressed the age of the universe. The final session of that addressed, uh, it was a breakout session we, of pastors, of 230, 40 pastors and leaders, to talk about these very issues, issues on, the, on the age of the universe. And uh, that material is on the, web, uh, uh, the website, Free Church website, Theology Conference 2017, if you're interested. But, Great. But it's encouraging to hear that affirmation or recommendation. There are some good resources that are out there. Great. Well, I'd ask you to please stand. Uh, and if you've got questions that you'd like to uh, uh, talk to Dr. Oswald, please, he'll be here for a few minutes and would be glad to uh, uh, visit with you. But let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful this day uh, that we have uh, begun the new school year and the lecture series. Uh, thank you that Dr. Oswald was uh, able to be with us. Thank you for this uh, good lecture um, that, that stimulates our thinking and not merely for the purpose or the sake or the end result of thinking, but for the purpose mm. of transformation, information for the, for the purpose of being conformed into the likeness of Christ. And Lord, we, we have been given, uh, we've been entrusted with the gospel, and we have tasks. We've been given responsibilities to minister to people, to others. Uh, dear God, we want to be faithful. Yes. Yes. And so, Lord, this, this day when we, we focus on creation... In the beginning God created, we also think that that finds a culmination in Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, yes. and the Word was God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.